Um, so, quick introduction to programmable logic. We're going to have a look at the history of digital electronics. Um, not spend too much time on this. Um, look at how we program these devices, what's the design flow for these, what sort of physical hardware is there in these little chips that we'll be using, and what are we dealing with at the moment, and what are our challenges, and there will be some time for Q&A. But as I say, we'd like to keep this pretty informal, so if you have any questions, feel free to stop me anytime. Um, okay, the story starts at uh, 1854. Uh, George Boole uh, uh, proposes the Boolean uh, logic, um, in which the traditional variables in algebra, algebra are replaced by truth values, zeros and ones. And in algebra we have addition, multiplication, whereas in this um, Boolean logic we have um, conjunction, disjunction, or more commonly known and um, or or operators and not operators. So this is a different way of looking at um, logic theory. And in 1937, Paul Shannon, when he was working on his master's thesis, uh, applies the Boolean logic into switching circuits. And um, the logic gate, as we know, is born. Does this have a laser pointer? It does. Awesome. So the and function proposed by George Boole is represented uh, by this little symbol here. As you can see, it has two inputs uh, and a single output. And the function of it is um, described in this truth table we have over here. So we have 0, 0 input, we have 0 output, and so on and so forth. The output only becomes 1 when both inputs are 1 as well. So digital logic consists of a collection, actually a lot of these logical expressions bundled together and this is the basis of all digital electronics that we're dealing with today. Um, and then in 1947 um, the transistor is discovered with the um, silic silicon transistor being introduced in 1954. We now have um, a way to represent these uh, logic elements or logic blocks uh, electrically using commercially off-the-shelf available beautiful transistors and people go crazy. Um, that's a ring oscillator, that's I think an output stage from a MOOC synthesizer. Um, and shortly after the introduction of these um, little silicon uh, transistors, people start building different families of logic devices or different ways of representing uh, logic. So um, DTL is diode transistor logic, so using discrete components like diodes and transistors and resistors, you now have the ability to put together these logical blocks together and then tie them together to perform a specific operation. Um, and with the introduction of the 7400 um, series of logic devices, we don't have to build these things out of discrete components anymore. Now they come prepackaged in a nice little plastic chip. Um, for instance, this is a uh, quad AND gate. Um, you can see that four AND gates are bundled into one chip, and by combining the lots and lots of these chips, you can start building computers now. And that's and all, of course there are loads and loads of these chips. You can buy anything from a quad two input NAND gate to a um, hex inverter to a triple three input NAND gate, and so on and so forth. So for pretty much every single logical function that you want to perform, you can now buy a very inexpensive little chip to do it. Um, and people, again, went crazy and started putting loads and loads of these on boards, uh, building their little computers. Um, this is such a beautiful picture. Um, and with the advent of microprocessors, um, this is the Apple II if you haven't noticed, um, we now start seeing the first generation of home computers and actual devices that make us play home and put graphical stuff on displays and stuff like that. But the problem is, the more um, complexity we want in our systems, the more we, chips we have to put down, etc. So, with the advent of, um, or with advances in the application-specific integrated circuits market, people start building more and more complicated devices. But the problem is, silicon manufacturing, even today, uh, actually, especially today, is extremely expensive. Um, today, if you want to create a custom chip, you are looking at spending millions of pounds. Um, while it probably wasn't millions of pounds back in the day, it still was very expensive. Therefore, um, a new generation of devices which can be programmed 
um, for a specific function, logical function, uh, were invented. The first one of them is the programmable logic arrays, PLAs. Now, silicon devices consist of several layers, uh, and each layer, uh, each custom layer, of course, adds to the manufacturing cost. So by having a standard plane of AND and OR gates um, in the lower layers, and just having the top layer, the top metal layer, configured to perform a specific function, you could get a semi-custom chip for, you know, not huge amounts of money. Um, so the idea here is that you only have, you only program the top metal layer uh, with, this, with these little dots to perform the specific function that you want, and you get a custom chip. The problem is you cannot program these at home. These are fabricated at big fabs with nice chemical components happening, etc. So this is not, you know, hobbyist or hackathon level stuff yet. And then. Programmable array logic um, came along, and you could actually program these at home. And the logic behind these was that, again, you would have a very general purpose connection matrix between logic elements, and then these little fuses that you could burn off using a high voltage source uh, to create a custom design. But the problem with these were they were one time programmable. Once you physically burn something, it's gone. So if you, you had to make sure that you know your design was um, fully working before you started producing hundreds of these of these things. So we're getting down to the level where we can start programming custom chips on our workbenches, but still it's not very convenient. Um, and then complex programmable logic devices (CPLDs) uh, were introduced. These are flash based, so you didn't have to have a high voltage um, source to burn fuses or you did not have to talk to a fab to manufacture a custom metal layer for you. Um, and they had the notion of microcells, uh, a collection of logic um, elements um, inside um, these little blocks that you could configure individually and then tie everything together to create a custom functionality within your system. Um, as I mentioned, they were EEPROM um, based or flash based, so you didn't have to burn anything, you could just, um, actually, well, no, it didn't have to burn anything in the, in the same way you did with fuses. Um, but a problem and actually a benefit of these devices were that they were quite coarse grain devices. Now that gives you the advantage that um, your design is easier to synthesize, well not easier to synthesize perhaps, but it gives you predetermined characteristics of timing delays, etc. But creating fine grain, really fine tuned architectures is not really, well, actually, it's not possible with these devices. And then came FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays. Instead of having complex um, macro cell blocks, these devices have a finer grain array of logic elements with a very flexible interconnect matrix between them uh, that you can reconfigure to uh, connect things together. Um, so again, it's based on blocks of logic. Think, you can think of it as a matrix of blocks with a flexible matrix, uh, connection matrix that lets you connect things uh, arbitrarily, almost arbitrarily. Um, and these are fine grained devices, which means that you can really do some crazy things with them. Um, they're used pretty much everywhere. Um, one advantage of FPGAs is that you can just buy them off the shelf. Uh, you don't have to uh, get custom chip manufactured. So for high-speed applications that you're not going to be selling in millions, FPGAs are the choice of device to use. They're used in um, signal processing, self-defined radio, defense systems, um, cryptography, computer vision, etc. So where you need high performance um, and custom processing elements, um, where you, you, can, you cannot just use a microprocessor, uh, FPGAs are the devices to use. Um, there are a couple logic vendors, uh, these companies produce FPGA devices, Lelynx is the biggest one I think. Uh, we're going to be using Altera uh, software tools and uh, hardware boards today. There are a couple other small startups as well. Um, so let's look at an FPGA. This is a great box, but let's say this is our FPGA fabric. Um, what, what is on this, uh, or what constitutes an FPGA? As we mentioned, you have different logic blocks, and you can see that they're different color. So, in most, actually, in almost 
in all modern FPGAs, you have different um, functionality blocks within um, your FPGA device. Um, there are even silicon blocks um, for speed reasons, silicon, say, DSP accelerators or uh, multipliers, etc., that you can connect to your programmable logic blocks. And local memories and all sorts of different things, um, all connected together with this interconnect matrix. Um, and um, of course, you need to interface your system to the outside world, so you also have input output blocks on the uh, edges of your um, device as well. Um, so if you look at inside, inside of one of these configurable logic blocks, uh, you'll see that it contains logic cells and slices. Um, and if you look at inside of a logic cell, you'll see that it looks a bit like this. Um, it contains uh, flip-flops um, that you can configure to generate lookup tables, simple logic elements, etc. So you don't, when you're programming dev these devices, you essentially create a description of what your circuit wants to do. You don't have to individually configure each single, each and every single one of those logic gates. You can do that if you want, um, but no. Um, we'll talk about the software flow in a minute. Um, and this is yet another one. This is a um, multiplier sort of MAC unit that you have in FPGAs that you use to do signal processing. So as you can see, it's both very general purpose and very specific um, in general functionality at the same time. It's a combination of all those different devices, uh, of the functionality, sorry. Um, OK, a small aside. When you compile a bit of software, this is a bit of C code, just print cellular world. Um, what happens? Um, you generate a set of instructions that are executed on your processor, processing device, your CPU. Um, now, unless you explicitly put a CPU in your FPGA design, you don't have this. So, you don't really use the term compile on FPGAs because there's nothing that can interpret your code unless, again, you explicitly put it there. So when we talk about FPGA compilation, what, what we actually mean is um, synthesis and implementation phases. Um, so a typical FPGA flow looks a bit like this. You put your design into your system, um, and then you go through lots of simulation, and the red blocks are simulation phases. Um, you go through the design entry, synthesis, implementation, and programming. Now, what do they actually mean? Let's look at them. Um, that's a bit unfortunate, but... <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's a schematic base. So there are a couple of ways you can do... Um, your, you can enter your design into your magical box with a screen and keyboard. Um, the first one is schematic base. You can actually draw individual logic gates, connect them together, and you can choose to synthesize um, a small computer system that you made out of gates. But for complex designs, this is not very easy to do. And yeah, it's not really easy to do at all. Um, the other way, the most common way, is to use hardware description languages. Now we have VHDL and Verilog. Um, I have bits and pieces of little notes about Verilog versus VHDL. Please don't take them as, you know, I know there are some religious wars between VHDL and Verilog, so mm -hmm. they're just for, they're light-hearted fun. Um, so um, yeah, VHDL is, um, has roots in ADA, and it was developed sort of for military applications, Department of Defense. Uh, Verilog is more for, it's more like C influence for software world, etc. Um, and aside from the actual description of your circuit, you need to specify certain constraints, like the floor plan. Um, your tools will automatically do this for you, but if you want to optimize your system, you may choose to move um, certain functionalities into, say, one part or one corner of your system. Um, you also provide timing constraints. Um, say, I would like this path to not take longer than 20 nanoseconds. And most importantly today is that you have the option to give power constraints so that your tool will try to optimize uh, your design for a certain power consumption criteria. Um, just a small example, this is what the HDL and uh, Verilog looks like. This is um, just a simple um, shift register. Um, and you can see that the HDL is pretty verbose um, and Verilog is more compact. Um, if you're from a software world, 
very long is easier to learn. If you're from a hardware world, VHDL is easier to learn. So Verilog was written by a bunch of hardware guys who knew nothing about software. We beat until until you could do software with it, and it was worse than VHDL. Yeah. Um, so aside from this, um, yeah, after we put in our syntax, um, well, actually our description of the circuit, we go through the synthesis phase, um, where first of all the syntax is checked, um, and you find that you've forgotten a million semicolons and stuff, um, and then the analysis and the optimization of the design, the hierarchical design happens, and at the end of this you end up with a description um, called netlist, which essentially describes how the blocks within your system are um, connected together. So after the synthesis phase, you go through the implementation phases, uh, there are three. The first one is translate. So in, in this step, you merge the netlist, the description of how the blocks within your system are connected with the constraints that you've specified, the timing, the power uh, constraints that you specified. Um, after this happens, you run functional simulation. Um, so after translation, map happens. Um, this is the phase where your um, system is, or the abstract representation of your system is actually mapped onto the blocks that we have in FPGAs. So um, your AND gates and your um, the blocks that you define are now mapped onto physical FPGA resources. Um, after this happens, because the characteristics of each of these blocks in silicon are known, uh, you go through static timing analysis to make sure that uh, your design matches the um, timing constraints that they have specified. Sorry. Um, after that, the final step is place and route, um, PAR, as it's um, affectionately known in the hardware world. This takes a long time. Um, this place is the map design, um, now uh, semi um, concrete description of your circuit or your design onto the FPGA fabric and actually decide how to connect things together. Um, remember that flexible interconnect matrix that we talked about. This is a step where blocks are determined and the connections between the blocks are made. Um, after that, again, you run through static timing analysis to make sure that the design meets the uh, criteria that you set. Um, and finally, after the implementation phase, you end up with what's called a uh, bitstream. This is a file that you can load onto your FPGA device, um, which contains your design. This, you can think of this as um, bytecode, or um, actually there's no match in the software for it. But yeah, this is essentially the finished product of your design, um, ones and zeros that represent your design. So, how do you actually program these things? Most FPGAs today are uh, volatile. So, if, you, if they lose power, they lose their configuration. And every time you boot them, you have to load the configuration data in. So, quite often, uh, on an FPGA board, you would have some sort of memory that will contain your bitstream or a collection of bitstreams um, that you program by a JTAG, a standard interface um, that's been used for quite some time. Um, so, if you have a processor in your design, you may choose to load the FPGA bitstream via that as well. Um, and if you look at open source projects uh, like the OpenBend Sniffer, the open source logic analyzer, they do that. Um, they just load stuff into the FPGA via a small PIC processor. It's quite a neat trick. Um, on your boards, on the V0 Nano, um, the JTAG is built in, in the board. Um, you don't have to have an external adapter plugged in to uh, do the configuration. Now, we've talked a lot about simulation, but what does it actually mean? So, when you design your circuit, you hopefully know what you want it to do. Um, and you know the outcome of, say, certain, or all, pretty much all the inputs that's coming into your circuit, you should know the output results. Therefore, you create uh, an ideal representation of the results that you expect on a certain set of inputs, and you put this in what's called a test bench. And then you run the test bench against your actual synthesized design to make sure that you haven't made any uh, programming errors. Um, so essentially you try to compare the outputs that come out of your actual synthesized design um, with the set of 
um, results that you have calculated previously <coughs> somewhere, or known results to make sure that um, your program is doing what you actually intended it to do. Um, this is ModelSim. You'll probably be using this later. Um, it looks a bit like this. You see a lot of waveforms. Um, and you can script this to do certain things as well. And you spend actually a lot of time in this, especially if you're getting a custom chip manufactured. You do not want to send you know, a wrong design because it's committed in silicon. It's extremely expensive to you probably need a new set of masks to fix that error, which will mean that you will leave the company soon. <laughs> um, so you spend a lot of time in simulators like this. Again, if you look at the flow, you start with design entry. This could be schematic or HDL based. You can use VHDL or Verilog. And then you do behavioral simulation. And then ha the synthesis happens, which maps um, your design, your VHDL or schematic entry into what's known, uh, what's known as a netlist, an abstract representation of connections between the blocks that you define in your system. Um, and then you, do, you go through the implementation phase where you map that abstract representation onto an actual um, bit stream that contains your design that's synthesized and implemented specifically for the PGA device that you're using. Uh, and then you program the bit stream um, via data or any other means um, and you should hopefully see some blinking lights on your board. Um, now we mentioned that FPGAs do not have do not act as processes, but you can actually add as soft core processes to them. Um, and this is co quite commonly used to orchestrate things. So you might have you might have lots and lots of uh, VHDL or very long blocks doing things, but for instance, networking, you might choose to do it on a sort of microprocessor system and then let the system be organized by this. Um, this is from the Xilinx trail, it's called Microbase. Um, there are lots of other um, software processes that you can use. And some FPGAs even have, say, physical ARM cores built into them as well. Again, you might choose to use it as the orchestrator of the system and use the logic resources to do serious number crunching, for instance, as opposed to just taking care of blink with some enemies. Um, and this is what it looks like. You generate your system, add blocks, and then assign addresses to them, etc. Um, if you're interested, we can talk more about this later. Tomorrow we're going to talk more about this. Julius is going to talk about the open risk. Hey, Julius. Um, and um, you'll, this won't be microbase, but it's actually quite a lot more interesting than microbase. Yeah. Um, so, FPG development happens on development boards mostly because Unlike Arduinos, you can't really breadboard FPGAs because they come in pretty horrible bold grid array packages and have, they have quite a lot of pins. Um, and the support circuitry is generally quite a uh, sort of pain in the neck as well. Um, so this is a sort of kitchen sink FPGA development board. Uh, it has everything from a character LCD to a couple of gigabytes of RAM and transceivers, etc. But luckily for us, we're not going to be dealing with something like this. We're going to use the DE0 Nano, which is awesome and cute. Um, this has an FPGA. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, it has a bit of configuration memory, which you can load your bitstreams into to load to boot your system. Um, this little guy takes care of the JTAG and stuff, um, so you don't have to have an external JTAG adapter. And there's an accelerometer here, so you can do a cool demo. I think Julius is going to do a demo tomorrow about uh, waving around to change LEDs and stuff, right, Julius? Yep. Um, so this is a very good starter board because it's not really complicated, and it gives you all these beautiful pin headers that you can stick external things into. Um, and I, I just have to put this here. This is a beautiful, beautiful board which has 101 FPGAs on it. Um, and you can't really buy this, I think, but you can rent it for £2,000 a month. Um, so, and also, they strictly would mention that you have to insure this board as well. So I, I guess when you have to insure your FPGA board, you know you're dealing with something serious. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much what I want to talk about. Oh, state of the art. So logic devices um, usually <coughs> use the cutting edge silicon technologies and all sorts of stuff. Um, 
like they they have the most transistors on an integrated circuit, or they have um, stupidly fast transceivers, uh, like the Vertex Seven can do 2.78 terabits per second. This is pro speed, of course, not protocol overheads, etc. Um, and then you have devices like Zinc, where you have a dual core ARM processor plus a serious amount of programmable logic, where you can do some seriously cool stuff with. So the world of programmable logic is really, really interesting. If you're interested, um, just have a look at the E Times or Benedict.com, uh, mostly microprocessors, but you can find crazy applications for FPGAs. So hopefully uh, you will enjoy this workshop and um, yeah, have some fun with FPGAs. Um, challenges, really quickly. Tool chains are horrible. Uh, you'll probably find this out um, throughout the course of today and tomorrow. Um, they're mostly closed source, they're clunky, they're big, they're horrible, they're... Ah, but yeah, you have to use them to... to um, and also, the software world is lucky, we have patterns, we have MVC, we have object-oriented programming and stuff. We don't really have that sort of thing in um, FPGA world, so every company, every vendor, every tool manufacturer has their own notion of organizing things together. Um, so this is a bit of a sort of nightmare as well. And this is very, this is very abstract, but it's also very relevant. Um, there are crazy stuff happening in these devices, but unfortunately using them is uh, very, very difficult for us mere mortals because um, the documentation generally sucks and it's really difficult to make use of all the crazy facilities that these things have. Um, so sometimes if you want to use the 2.78 terabits per second transceiver, you'll have to do a lot of digging and in the end you'll have to talk to someone from the company to actually figure out how it works. Um, but yeah, other than that everything's fine. So thank you very much, that was my part of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to... Um, Can you just, just remind us that the, the grain, I think you asked that at all, so the coarse grain and fine grain. Um, coarse grain essentially means that you have a lot of stuff bundled into a sort of general purpose or general purpose block. Now your design might fit very well into it, or it might not be able to use the pre-configured set of devices that's within that block very sort of efficiently. So if you have a fine grain architecture, you have more flexibility in optimizing your design. But if it's coarse grain, you can't. But as I've mentioned, coarse grain means that you can do timing analysis and not easy. Well, you can ensure that the timing criteria can be made more easily yeah. because there's less sort of flexibility, if that makes sense. Um, and fine grain essentially means you can have it small. Anything else? Just out of curiosity, that big board, what is it being used for? That's used for ASIC emulation. So if you're going to send out quite a large design to be manufactured in silicon, you want to kind of make sure it works before you do that. So you use those sort of stupidly large and expensive ports to emulate your really, really large ASIC designs. And probably you can use it to heat up the room as well. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a space heater. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can do two of them, I'm sure you can. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Is there a, a live um, to MPAs? That's if you continue to reprogram them over a period of time. Like there is, yes. Um, but it's generally quite a city, city large number. Do you not know where the live is at? CPLDs are sort of more. Um, they have a more finite lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, but because FPGAs use SRAM cells, essentially just their transistors, they tend to be much more happy with like the memory program. Okay. Software, software is generally mostly um, linear, sequential code, and it harbors parallel. It is parallel. So, uh, uh, yeah, other special things that uh, I want to have the There are. So, hardware or silicon inherently is parallel. So, you can have um, lots and lots of functionality happening in different parts of your device um, in parallel. Uh, not even in parallel, because, well, it's different sets of logic. 
But there are certain times, there are certain things that we need sequential execution for. And for that, we can use state machines, like uh, FSM, SSM, and we can coordinate your system to have states. And then only after it meets a certain criteria, and so you can go to another state. There's a whole presentation coming up about this. Yes. Uh, and you can also use cross <laughs> I mean, presumably when you first boot up an FPGA, the boot up time to, to get the design data out of configuration of the FPGA is yep. sort of like 10 to milliseconds or something. You know. For small designs, yes. But for really, really large FPGAs, you have to employ some really weird techniques to meet, say, timing criteria for buses and stuff like that. So for instance, on large FPGAs, if you're doing PCI, negotiation. If you're designing a PCI or PCI Express card, there's a, I can't remember the exact period, but there's a finite time that you have to announce yourself to the uh, controller before it can be picked up and you're registered on the system the table. But really, a large FPGAs cannot be booted in that time period. So what you do is you boot a minimal design just to announce yourself that, hey, hey I'm here. And then after that boot up, initial boot up phase, you load the rest of the design. So, yes, it happens really quickly, but there are techniques you can use to, to do studying with that. I think that's a pretty good practice. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <laughs> no? I think we're good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot